Hey everyone, welcome back to the Neuro Health Broadcast. I'm your host, Dr. Joe, and today we are talking concussion and chronic pain. Here to have that conversation with us is Dr. Caitlin Davis of Davis Chiropractic in San Diego, California. Uh, she gives us a lot of great information, and I just want to let you know some of those key takeaways. Uh, number one, we're going to learn how the brain actually controls the body how differences in brain function can relate to uh, pain, and how a concussion can lead to long-term unresolved pain. So I think uh, a lot of you are going to get a lot of great information from this, especially those who have prior concussions or have been suffering with long-term chronic pain without much resolve. So we're going to take a look at how your brain really uh, plays a vital role in your um, pain processing and production of pain. So after a quick announcement, we're going to talk with Dr. Kate Davis about concussion and chronic pain. This podcast is brought to you by Delta Neuro Health, located in Columbus, Ohio, where non-invasive personalized care is revolutionizing the way we approach complex neurological issues. With cutting edge techniques in functional neurology, functional medicine, and chiropractic care, we're leading the way in managing conditions like concussion, dizziness, brain fog, anxiety, POTS, attention, and more. To learn more, visit our website at deltaneurohealth.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Kappas, and today we are joined by our guest, Dr. Caitlin Davis. Thank you for joining us today. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Excited to be on your show, Joe. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, Dr. Davis is located in San Diego, California, which is way warmer than where I am right now. So we can all be a little jealous of her <laughs> today. Um, I'm about to so, go to the beach after this. Oh uh, my gosh. First. <laughs> I'm about to de-ice my car after this. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Davis uh, works out of Davis Chiropractic. Um, that's where you can find her. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice before we get into the topic today, which is, by the way, concussion uh, as concussion rehab and chronic pain. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I started my practice a little over two years ago, and I specialize in concussion rehab and chronic pain. That's the title of the, the podcast. <laughs> uh, but I see all sorts of different people, you know, like athletes who've had concussions, um, even just for sports performance. I have some athletes who come in. I work with, you know, high-level military people, um, and then just general people who just are very active. You know, San Diego is such an active city where people take care of themselves, or with rock climbing, surfing, doing you know, fun stuff. And, and it's really just uh, people coming in who have like chronic injuries that they've never been able to really resolve. You know, they've gone to PT, they've gone to chiropractic, they've gone to massage, and they just haven't had the results. So my practice has always been word of mouth referral. Um, so usually when I help someone, they send me all their friends and family, which is nice. So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I just, I basically use neurology to help get people out of pain. And I also use it to help people recover from concussions. So, and I, I got into it because I had a really bad concussion when I was 18 and mm -hmm. I was messed up for about five years. Like I couldn't remember anything. I'd repeat myself all the time. I felt dumb and I know I wasn't a dumb person. <laughs> and uh, I can I, attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> very, you know, she's definitely not a dumb person. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> but yeah, I just didn't feel like myself for five mm -hmm. years, you know, all through college and which is always rough when you're introducing yourself to someone freshman year and they're like, yeah, we just met yesterday. And you're like, oh, remind <laughs> me of that conversation. What did we talk about? And then you're like, oh, okay, I remember now. <laughs> and so yeah, just, you know, going from that journey to finding a chiropractic neurologist who, you know, just changed my life, you know, less than a year, he, he fixed every issue I had. And I feel like I was better neurologically coming out of that than before the accident even happened. And so 
I just use like my story and my passion for that to help people. And I think they really appreciate hearing that I've been through what they've been through. So. Yeah. And I think those practitioners who have that personal experience dealing with the thing that you're treating, you have that next level of empathy. Um, yeah. You have that next level of understanding. And I think patients really appreciate that and uh, resonate well with that. Yeah, definitely. I've actually, it's, it's really cool. Cause when I tell people like, cause they come in they're like, yeah, I just feel dumb. I don't know if I'm ever going to get better. And I'm just, I'll tell them my story and they literally just start crying. Cause like, they don't, they don't have any hope. They've been to neurologists who are like, oh, it'll just resolve on its own. Or they say, oh, you're going to be stuck this way, which is, you know, you and I both know that's not true. Like anyone who's read, you know, research on concussions in the past 20, 30 years knows the ability of the brain to change mm -hmm. and how, how powerful it is and how easy it is to just create new connections in the brain and get things to work better and get people back to where they were. So it's, it's really rewarding to just be able to help people in that way. And, mm -hmm. um, like I'm still seeing a family, they'll come in every once in a while where I helped the youngest, uh, youngest daughter. Um, she had, I think four or five concussions playing soccer when she was 19 and she couldn't even remember going on vacations. Mm -hmm. Like she, her memory was just, it wasn't there at all when she came to see me. And after, you know, four months of just basic, like, Hey, let's get these parts of your brain firing again. And with adjustments and things like that, she just hasn't had an issue since then. Mm -hmm. it's just It's crazy. So. And I think, um, maybe crazy to say, but I think a lot of people take their brains for granted. Um, it's the most powerful organ we have. It controls literally everything, uh, in our body um everything we do affects the brain in some way yet maybe one of the more neglected parts of our bodies you know yeah so yeah and it's, it's not a physical injury like you can't see it you mm -hmm. know so people get head injuries they just feel like your emotions are off i had really bad anger issues after mm -hmm. my head injury and i never had that before so that was something where I was like, whoa, I don't know why I exploded like that. But that's very common where people, their personality changes. And it's things that you don't recognize unless you're really close to that person where you're like, wow, this person is different. I don't know what it is. Can't put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. But it's just stuff that's not visible. So people, people don't understand. You're not on crutches. You don't have a cast on. You don't have like a wound you're, you're healing from where people can be like, oh, wow, you're actually injured. It's more mental and emotional and psychological and that. I think is uh, really hard for a lot of people. So. Right. Right. And I think that's also probably one of the couple tough things there that you, you kind of alluded to, but number one, it's an invisible injury. So people who are struggling with post-concussion or concussion, they may have a hard time uh, getting people on board with what they're experiencing, right? It's not like a broken leg where you can see like the crutches or whatever it may be. So a lot of times they're kind of struggling on their own, which is really tough. Um, and the second point, um, the symptoms from concussion can be so widespread and mm -hmm. seemingly unrelated where it's like, yeah, now I'm angry all of a sudden. I don't really know why. But then it takes someone like yourself to say, oh, well, you had this concussion in 2000, blah, blah, blah. And shortly afterwards, that's when yeah. your anger issue started. So yeah. there's most likely a connection. Yeah, definitely. So and it's really hard to see that in teenagers, too, because parents will just chalk it up to, oh, well, it's just their hormones or the doctors will tell them that. And, you know, my experience was the neurologist I went and saw, I came back to him, you know, halfway through freshman year of college. And I was like, hey. Like something's very wrong. I can't remember meeting people. I feel it was really hard for me to form words. And I think that's why it's hard for people to talk about it when they have a concussion is they just can't think straight. So trying to find the words to explain to someone what's going on is really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I told the doctor and he's like, oh, well, it's just your freshman year. You're meeting a lot of people. That's normal. And he just, it felt like he just wasn't listening. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Like I literally introduced myself to someone the day after I met them and had a conversation with them. That's not normal and he's like well you're just meeting a lot of people it's new it's a new environment and you know they just completely blow you off and yeah i don't think it's really their fault they're just not taught how to fix something they're taught how to how to diagnose and what sort of you know drug or therapy can they give someone but they don't know hey if your brainstem's not functioning here's some things you can do to get it to fire better and you know like we learn in, in functional mm -hmm. neurology or chiropractic neurology whatever you want to call it 
is that you can just combine a simple eye exercise or vestibular or anything with a neck adjustment and you just get mm -hmm. a huge stimulus to the brain. And it's just those things that they're not taught in med school, you know, because they're just very, right. very narrow minded. And so that was that was definitely my experience. And a lot of my patients have that experience, too, where they're just they don't have any hope because they've been to doctors who are just haven't helped them. So. Mm -hmm. And brains, everyone's brains are very nuanced. Everyone's brain injury is very nuanced. That's why it takes a more nuanced approach to address these things. You can't really put someone in a box like this is your diagnosis. This is your treatment. You know, that doesn't always equate. So you need a, a very individualized and like I said, nuanced approach if you're going to help that person. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, like the symptoms are so very, you know, some people get really bad migraines or they have sleep issues or they have emotional issues like I did, or they have really bad memory. Some people can't handle light. So even just walking outside just causes so much, you know, discomfort and disorientation because they just don't, you know, have that pupillary reflex that's working properly because maybe they have some brainstem damage or things mm -hmm. like that. Really just, like you said, you know, the brain is so unique and so differently damaged depending on what happens and, you know, your life experiences and anything else going on in your body at that time that it's right. just hard to, you can't lump people in a box. <laughs> like right. you said, I think that's, that's why you and I get such good results is just, it's very much, you know, you could have 10 people come in with a concussion and they all have a different treatment plan. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I love what you just said there too. Everybody's at a different stage in their life as well. When the concussion happens, you may have somebody who's going through puberty when they get their concussion and that's going to present a whole mm -hmm. host of particular issues. Maybe you have someone who is blindsided. Maybe you have some, maybe it's a male versus a female and the different uh, effects that concussion might have on those individuals. Maybe it's someone who's a little bit older, you know, who may not um, recover as quickly as well or compensate as quickly. Um, so, so a lot of factors that go into it, nutritional status as well. Um, so a lot of things to consider. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the body is a giant machine that we're still trying to figure out. So mm -hmm. there's so many things that cross over and you can even get into like the functional medicine aspect of it. Mm -hmm. of at the time of their head injury, did they have a mold infection or parasites or yeah. heavy metals in the body? Because that, mm -hmm. the, you know, especially the mold and heavy metals already attack your brain, your, your central nervous system. So it's, you add on a head injury to that and you right. have some really severe stuff going on where they just, you know, they can't walk straight because their vertigo is so bad or things like that. Right. And we weren't necessarily planning to go down that route, but I think you're highlighting another great point is, you know, these traditionally functional medicine type um, uh, diagnoses or treatments um, like mold or leaky gut, maybe, for example, can be worsened by a concussion or may present themselves even people may be more susceptible to uh, digestive complaints or mold or what have you. Uh, after concussion or leading up to concussion so these things are are kind of compounding on each other yeah definitely so it's just yeah that's why you need the you know the overall holistic approach of okay mm -hmm. can I even adjust this person as a chiropractor are they like mm -hmm. is the brain healthy enough for that because you you know some people if you were to just go for a neck adjustment they'd probably throw up because yeah. their, their system is just so bad and, uh, and then you have to, you know, consider, can I actually do vision work with them or do I have to start somewhere more safe, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe some cerebellum stuff or something like sensory work, things like that. And so mm -hmm. I think it's just like really, it's really cool because you can just look at the whole picture of the person and just use whatever's in your, your bag of tricks as, you know, my patients like to call it. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you, you always have like a new bag of tricks you're using on me. And I'm like, yeah, we should always be learning as a doctor, right? Right. You know, always learning new stuff and growing and trying to find better ways to help people. And then it just mm -hmm. gives you a bigger picture of, you know, like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And when you graduate school, you have like 250 pieces put together. And then, you know, five years in, maybe you have like 600 and it's like the picture starting to become clear on how to treat patients and get them better faster. So, right. so yeah, everything. You got to look at all of it. <laughs> yep. And what works for one patient isn't going to work for the next. So that's why we always need to be growing and evolving our toolboxes. So Oh, yeah. That's great, which I know for a fact that you do a great job of doing that. So, <laughs> um, 
a perpetual student. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what we we've got to be. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to segue into this. I feel like this is a natural segue, but how then do you approach your examination of a patient? Um, what what are what's going into that process? Because we talked about there's so many factors. How do you actually accept that patient and understand what's going on? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, the first thing is going to be their history. You've always got to look at, okay, what traumas have they had in the past? Um, what are they going through right now currently? Any medication for on things like that? Because that'll give you a good picture of, okay, I should probably consider concussion for this person if they've been in five car accidents. There's most likely something going on with their brain that's creating, if it's a chronic pain issue or whatever they're coming in with. Another thing is just, you know, when they walk in, you can just see how, you know, after years in practice, you just pick up on things and notice things more. Like I've noticed that about myself where the the doctors we used to shadow in chiropractic school, where we'd be like, wow, how'd they pick all that up in like two minutes? Like Dr. Ellis, mm -hmm. just like, he's like, yeah, did you see the shoulder was like this? And the eye was like, and I'm like, I was just trying to look at their posture. What are you talking about? <laughs> And it's like, we're starting with such basic stuff, but after a while, it just becomes like, as soon as a patient walks in, you can see, okay, how are they walking? Because we know mm -hmm. the way someone walks tells us how their brain is functioning yep. uh, or it can be a good window into that. And then you look at their posture, you look at how their eyes sit in their skull. And if one's higher than the other, you think, okay, maybe there's a cerebellum issue mm -hmm. uh, going on there. And so it's just all those little things that you just can get a snapshot of in the first 30 seconds of meeting someone that gives, for me, it gives me a good idea of, what should I be testing on this person? And then obviously like what they're going through, you know, if someone comes in and everything hurts, I'm just like, okay, there's something like central going on there, you know, because you know, pain, pain, posture, movement, 80% of it, about 80% is determined by how your, well your brain is functioning. So if someone comes in and they're like, yeah, my spine hurts, my ankle, my shoulder, or maybe they have pain on all one side of the body that can also tell you, okay, maybe brainstem related, uh, maybe PMRF stuff going on. So it really just, you know, like it depends. <laughs> so yeah. it's just how is the person walking, how are they presenting? Are they having trouble finding words? You know, it's all these things that you can pick up in the first 30 seconds of meeting someone that tells you, okay, I need to check this person's vestibular system or maybe do some coordination testing or test the brain stem. And just figuring out all that stuff, you can actually get a solid exam and a treatment done in an hour if you can just pick up that stuff really quickly. And I feel like I've gotten to the point where I can pick up a lot of that stuff a lot quicker than I used to, or I would need more time for a neuro exam. And now I can just kind of figure out honing in on what to actually focus on versus doing a whole neuro exam and then just mm -hmm. trying to figure it out from there. So. Right. Yeah, kind of my and, <laughs> and, uh, I think people often ask, you know, what, what goes into the exam process? You know, they want, well, what's the exam like? And as you were talking, I'm like, you know what, your life is your functional neurology exam essentially yeah. so it's like how are you presenting yourself in the world and moving in the world like how is it, said, your body posture just you being that is your your exam right there if you can observe how a person is existing you can kind of tell like how is their brain functioning because like we said earlier the brain controls everything it controls gait it controls posture eye position so if some of those things are off you can say okay i know these parts of the brain are affected I can already start formulating in my head. What are some things I can do to uh, help this person? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like a, someone who does chiropractic, but not neurology or someone who's a PT or massage therapist, they might look at someone and say, oh, the shoulder's internally rotated and so is the foot. So they probably have a hip flexor and pec issue. Whereas we would look at that person and say, they probably have a cerebellum issue on that side. Mm -hmm. There's probably something going on that was never treated. And then you can ask, you know, about, you can see how they form their thoughts. And if they struggle with that, it's like, okay, probably cerebellum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's coordination of thought and movement, not just, not just movement. So it's, it's cool to just get the different perspectives that people have. And yeah, like when patients ask you, like you said, what is your exam? Like, um, it depends. Mm -hmm. Like I know patients hate that answer. They're just like, what do you mean? But it's just, that is the real answer for almost every medical question. It depends on you. Like there is, we've all been stuck in this mindset of, okay, there's a disease and one treatment for it. And everyone gets that treatment when that's not in reality, how people heal. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at everything. Everyone has a unique history, unique past, unique things are going through, um, unique physiology, things are fighting off internally, things like that. So there's no one exam that's going to 
be for everyone. And so some people I, I can kind of gauge, okay, this is more musculoskeletal. Let me start there to get them out of pain. And then I'll talk to them about the neuro versus right. other people where I'm like, no, we got to look at your brain. Cause I know you've already been to a chiropractor. I know you've been to a PT massage and you've gotten zero results. Let's start with your brain and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And those are the people who are just blown away because they're like, whoa, I've never felt this good and actually like held it for this long because it really was just a brain issue. It's not anything wrong with their ankle or their shoulder. It's just your eyes literally don't move because you're like this behind a computer all day. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should look at that for your chronic neck pain or your, right. your back pain or things like that. And yeah, so there's just so many different avenues to go down with a new patient. Which um, a question for you then, and we've we've been talking alluding to it, I think, um, a lot of this episode, but if we have somebody who's listening to this and they're completely foreign to the concept of, you know, the brain controlling the body, vice versa, um, and you're saying, you know, oh, maybe we can help your neck pain with, by fixing your brain, or maybe we can help your hip pain by uh, addressing the brain. Uh, how, how do you go about explaining that to uh, kind of that person who's just fresh to that idea? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so the way I always explain it to people is, you know, like we, like I said earlier, about 80% of your posture, your movement, and your pain levels is determined by how healthy and well your brain is functioning. And so a lot of people can understand that. They're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But what do you mean by the brain? And so then I can break it down and say, okay, there's certain parts of the brain that control certain muscle groups. So you can kind of think of you know, those little puppeteers with the little strings hanging down to the little puppet. Mm -hmm. And your brain is kind of like the puppet master in terms of like muscle and joint firing. Your brain controls how your joints fire, how your muscles move, all that stuff. And so if you have one part of the brain that's functioning really well and another part that's not, obviously the muscles on that side are just going to not be functioning the way they're supposed to. And you're just going to have all this muscle tension on one side and not on the other, or you're going to have joints that move really well and then other joints that don't. And just explaining to people like, hey, this part of your brain controls extensor muscles and you're literally stuck like this where you're just caved in all the time. Uh, just kind of, it's it's kind of hard, but I think the puppeteer thing helps people of like, mm -hmm. oh, if one is pulling more than the other, how do you think the other side of the body is going to feel? And they're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's going to kind of just make you a little crooked and and you know people who get scoliosis, things like that. Mm -hmm. It's just because the brain is literally pulling the muscles on one side more than the other. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, just explaining to them that different parts of the brain control different muscle firing and different, different joints in your body. And I always have people do that thing where they, if you take your fingers and just lightly touch below the base of your skull and just quickly mm -hmm. move your eyes side to side, I'm like, yeah, do you feel those muscles fire? And they're like, yeah, what the heck? And I'm like, yeah, because your eye movement controls your neck muscle movement. So if your eyes aren't moving well, because they're just staring at a screen all day, you know, they have six muscles around them that are controlling how they're moving. And if those aren't firing on a regular basis, it's just like being in a cast where your muscle just starts to get weak. And then all of a sudden your eyes don't fire well. And then all of a sudden your neck doesn't fire well. And then from more of a neurological perspective, the eyes, the better they move, the more midline stability you have. So for a chiropractor, you just explain that to people like, yeah, the better your eyes move, the better your spine is going to move. And they're just like, oh, I never thought of that. And just having people do before and afters. I'm like, here, do a spinal rotation. Let's check your neck range of motion. Now do, and then I'll give them an eye exercise that I know is going to make it, like make them feel better for just that, like, holy cow, how did that actually, you know, fix my, <laughs> my pain? Like I was working on a nurse practitioner the other day and she was interested in the neuro. I was like, here, let's try an eye exercise. She's having a lot of shoulder neck pain. And I had her do just neck range of motion before and after just from doing a simple eye exercise, she got about 30 degrees more range of motion in all directions. And I, she was like, what the heck? I was like, yeah, it's an eye problem. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. your muscle, it's not your joint. It's literally your brain is just so fatigued from staring at a screen, from charting all day, from not mm -hmm. moving, that you have to just start moving your eyes. And so I think it can be difficult to explain it to people, but obviously analogies tend to work well for most people. Mm -hmm. and, and just kind of explaining that, you know, your brain is so sensitive that it's better to have a lower functioning brain where both sides are functioning evenly than to have a high functioning brain that's off where mm -hmm. you have, you know, the right side is firing way more than the left, because obviously it's going to affect everything on the opposite mm -hmm. side of the body. You know, you're going to have more muscle tone on one side or not be able to feel pain on one side. Like I couldn't feel any pain on the left side of my body after my head injury. 
mm-hmm. which was great. But whenever I go get, you know, treated for stuff, they'd be like, wow, your left side's really locked up. And I'd just be like, oh, okay. I never feel pain. <laughs> you so, say so. Yeah, I'm just like, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's really just understanding that the reason your body moves so well and so quickly and you don't have to think about it is because your brain's controlling it. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. hopefully that made sense. It did, definitely. Mm-hmm. And I, I love... My wife has been with me long enough where she she gets this concept pretty well, where we'll just be out on a run together and like her, I don't know, her ankle will start to get a little tight and she'll just stop us and she's like, okay, do, do the thing really quick. I'm like, okay. So we stop in the middle of the running trail, you know, we're doing like left brain exercises and, yeah. and like, okay, she's like, okay, that's better. And then we go. <laughs> and he's like, looking like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> awesome i don't even care i'll do my exercises in the park i'm just yeah. like you know, just doing some like vorcs just like mm-hmm. don't mind me just do my <laughs> exercises yeah, don't mind me yeah it's a great conversation starter because you'll be like oh for sure over there mm-hmm. <laughs> but um no that you explained that very very well and i really like the uh the concept of the cast when you're looking straight ahead all day long and you're not moving your eyes but i think one issue with casting just that concept in general is uh, the muscles start to get weaker and atrophy, right? Mm-hmm. But there's also the phenomena where like, let's say you cast your two fingers together, your um, pointer and your middle finger together. And then six weeks later, uh, your brain actually starts to create a map of your hand where those are now one finger, not separate yeah. and distinct. So now you're looking at these six muscles in your neck that aren't really uh, or sorry, these six eye muscles and then these muscles in the neck that aren't being used that much, your brain might start to create uh, skewed maps of those muscles and things are just going to be moving in block together, which is going to yeah. cause the recruitment of less um, like spinal stability type muscles and more like big muscles like the traps potentially, which is why, oh yeah, I'm always tense in my in my upper exactly. traps right so I'm not sure if that's that's something yeah. you uh see often oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what i have to explain to people when um i do these things with patients i don't know if you've done this before where you do infinity walks where you have them stare at something on the wall and they walk in mm-hmm. an infinity pattern and mm-hmm. you can do different versions to get different parts of the brain to fire but one i really like to do for low back pain it's it's a vestibular exercise right so it's that inner part of your brain that deals with balance and Every time you move your head quickly, that's the part of the brain we're talking about, the stibular system. But I have to explain to people, like you said, with the multifidi. So the, there's these tiny little stability muscles that go down and just hold every little vertebra together to the one, you know, above and below it. And those are the ones that, like you said, aren't firing in people. And it's most of that is vestibular driven. You know, if you don't have a good functioning vestibular system, those little muscles just shut off. And then, like you said, you get, you know, the glutes and the QL and the lat and the upper trap trying to stabilize your spine. And then all of a sudden your, your range of motion's limited. You can't move very well. You're stiff. It's hard to adjust those people. When in reality, if you just do a little vestibular exercise, all of a sudden they're like, oh, my back pain went away. I'm like, mm-hmm. Yeah, your brain. <laughs> right. And there's the thought that, um, you know, idiopathic scoliosis, there mm-hmm. might be a, a vestibular... Uh, precursor to developing that because kind of like we've been talking about if we have imbalances in the brain especially if we have vestibular imbalances in the brain that are changing the way that those uh, tiny muscles in the spine are firing if they're firing unevenly that's Mm going to over time potentially lead to uh, curvature in the spine oh 100 percent so, yeah, actually, like I talked about earlier with the imbalance in the brain, mm-hmm. if you have one side of the vestibular system firing all the time and the other side's not, it's going to eventually pull that spine to that side because mm-hmm. those muscles are so much stronger. Eventually, you're going to get all that curvature going on in the spine. And that's what I work on with scoliosis patients. The first thing I check is the vestibular system, cerebellum, getting those firing again, and, you know, working on some brainstem stuff to also help with the, those little muscles going down the neck and the upper back. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah it's just it's it's so crazy how quickly you can get someone feeling better when you just start with the brain <laughs> right i mean yeah. why not start with uh yeah. the most important organ in the body so yeah yeah 
Yeah, something um, that really hit me when I was in school, since you keep saying the most important organ, was that the brain is the only organ that actively studies itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we're literally studying the brain, it's like the brain studying itself. And I was just like, like that, yeah. that thought yeah. hit me when I was in school. And I was like, whoa, that's yeah. crazy. So we've we've talked a lot about uh, brain asymmetry, which then leads to body asymmetry, which then could lead to chronic pain. How does then concussion uh, lead into chronic pain? How does that fit into the picture? Yeah, so you have that that concept in functional neurology of what's called transneural degeneration, which basically is just when an area of the brain gets damaged and you don't fix it you know like the signaling just goes way down and it's not firing the way it should what happens is all the areas surrounding that that part of the brain that's damaged will start to also slowly decrease in function and you know it might not happen right away some people will get chronic pain and they won't make the connection of oh i had this head injury you know five years ago and now i have chronic back pain or my ankle hurts really bad or you know all these different things and like we talked about before, you know, like the brain is like a little puppeteer in your body. And if one side's over firing way more than the other, you're going to get those asymmetries. You're going to get those bad movement patterns. You're going to get less stability in the spine because those parts of the brain that are supposed to hold it together and keep it stable so that you have relaxed muscles and better movement are going to stop functioning the way they should. And so then you get, it's not, and people always want to know like, well, what, what is it? Like what particular part of the brain? And it's, it's just all of it. It all connects together. It all fires together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's certain areas of the brain that from basically the brain all the way down to, you know, spinal nerves in your foot are connected. It's just, there is no one answer for everyone. It's all just testing and figuring out. Okay. <clears throat> like I said, with scoliosis patients, if you have a stibular issue, you're going to have a spine issue. Like, 90% of the low back pain patients I see, we always have to do vestibular rehab with them to get them completely out of pain. That's just something I see in everyone. Otherwise, they're those people who get better and then once they go back to their activity, they get worse again. And if you want those long lasting long term results, you've got to fix the signal in the brain that's telling the spine to to basically be stable and relax those bigger muscles so they're not always over firing and straining them. So I think it's just it's a uh, probably a more complicated answer, but I think it's the best I can can word it is just you know those areas of the brain just start to decline if you never fix them if you never go see you know a functional neurologist uh, mm -hmm. or someone who does some sort of neurological rehab like a PT who specializes in vestibular work or you know anyone else who's just really knowledgeable like we have personal trainers here who do uh, they did they went through Z Health so did I mm -hmm. where it's basically just functional neurology for athletes and sports performance and they're working on chronic pain patients too and getting great results and it's just they do it from a movement perspective we do it from a chiropractic perspective um and it really is is just getting the brain to function better to even it out so we have an equally firing brain so that now those muscles those joints are stabilized they're firing together so you're not getting abnormal movement patterns and you know postural abnormalities and things like that like I see rock climbers come in all the time and they're just like yeah I have shoulder pain and I don't know why and I'm like really because your your humerus is like in your ear so I don't have know have you been <laughs> you in front of a mirror that? lately yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like did you notice that like I was joking yeah. with one of my climbers because uh, we did a lot of work with her and a lot of it was neuro mm -hmm. and that the chronic shoulder pain she'd had completely gone and um but I was joking with her because she got married this last week. And I was like, yeah, see, now you're going to be even in your pictures. You're welcome. Because when you mm -hmm. walked in first, you were like this. And now you're going to look even in all your wedding photos. That's right. That's worth the cost of admission right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's just, I hope I explained that well. But I think it's just, you know, again, it goes back to it depends on the patient, right? It's like what part mm -hmm. of the brain is functioning. You know, if you have brainstem issues, that can cause pain on one side of the body. That can cause abnormal movement where you see those people who walk with like one foot sticking out and the, mm -hmm. the other foot walking straight. I mean, you know, over thousands and thousands and thousands of reps of walking like that, something's mm -hmm. going to break, you know, you're going to get hip issues or knee issues or low back stuff. And so it's all about your body's all about symmetry, just like the brain. If you have asymmetries in your body, eventually the joints are going to wear out. The muscles are going to overfire. You're going to get some nerve impingement. Something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's the biggest thing for people to understand is that we have to have symmetry in the brain to get symmetry in the body. Right. So they don't and I think um, <clears throat> something also important to consider when it comes to concussion and chronic pain is, you know, like we said, 
concussion can be so wide reaching as far as the symptoms that can present uh the brain controls everything so you have a neurophysiological injury to the brain and then even if you quote unquote healed after a month mm -hmm. chances are things aren't quite like they used to be there's probably there's a neurophysiological disruption in those connections in those pathways some people are better at compensating than others so you may feel like you're better but then other issues may start to manifest down the road right because maybe now your shoulders a little higher that's yeah. not going to be something that's going to be immediately problematic to you right but over time and the longer you you kind of as long as that uh, transneural degeneration can uh, occur for you know that might just get worse and worse your compensation uh, might get more and more pronounced and then maybe you get hit again and you know then it's pronounced or maybe just it takes a long time of being in that asymmetrical um, posturing for for the symptoms to present themselves to you but maybe you could still uh, trace it back to a concussion you had when you were in high school football or ice skating whatever it was so yeah and you like I'm sure you've worked on professional athletes before but they're the biggest compensators in the world mm -hmm. so, you know trying to tell them like hey I think this is from like a part of your brain that's not working they're just like what do you mean what do you mean my brain's not working mm -hmm. <laughs> and you just think about like all the asymmetrical sports like even just moving asymmetrically mm -hmm. Like yeah. we know that movement fires our brain. That's why it's so good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you play like baseball or volleyball or basketball, it's like you're always using one side of your body. So it's going to create that asymmetry in the brain just because of, you know, one-sidedness and always using, you know, same movement patterns, things like that. But when they get head injuries, they're so athletic and so good at moving that they're always going to find some compensation to, to make up for it. You know, mm -hmm. especially with MMA fighters, they have such a high pain tolerance that they're just like, what do you mean? I haven't had a concussion. And they're, you know, they have like a broken nose or they're fractured their skull. And they're like, no, I'm fine. I feel great. And it's, <laughs> it's like trying to tell people like, let's just look at this and see what happens. And then you do like vision work with them. And all of a sudden their neck moves and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's. Has that yeah. always, have, has my neck always been able to move? Yeah. <laughs> like I thought, I thought I didn't know I, necks moved like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and people, people with that sport, it's, you know, it's pretty brutal. So like their neck yeah. range, you know, ask them and they're just like, yeah, that's, that's all I got. And but I mean, just, just think about how crucial that is to address because if somebody's compensating and they don't have full range of motion or they don't have full control over their bodies, they're more likely to get injured. They're more likely to get another head injury, which the next one may mm -hmm. not be so forgiving as the previous that you've yeah. experienced so yeah. I think that's something important for people to keep in mind as well yeah yeah and then you can get into you know like the symptomatology discussion right where it's like oh well, all my symptoms went away so I'm fine after my head injury and they're, they're looking at you and their eyes are like this and you're like mm, really are you <laughs> that's good and, but <laughs> yeah and so people always rely on their symptoms as an indicator of health which is like the worst thing you can do mm -hmm. like there's I don't remember the percentage, but I know there's a lot of studies out there that talk about how chronic disease has to be, I think at least like 60 to 80% progress before you even experience symptoms. Like mm -hmm. think about cancer, liver disease, things like that. It doesn't show up until it's, you know, not working very well at all. Yeah. <laughs> and same thing with your brain. It's like, you might have the symptoms be gone, but if you have that imbalance in your brain, you know, it might be 10, 20, 30 years down the road where all of a sudden you're just like, why do I have, you know, chronic low back pain, never hurt my back in my entire life? Why am I experiencing brain fog? Why am I getting, you know, dizzy or vertigo or things like that? And so I think it's really important for people who, even if they've had a concussion and they feel fine after, like, yeah, you might be one of those people, like you said, who just compensate really well in their brain, but we still got to get the brain functioning again. You know, mm -hmm. it's the brain health is so important as you age, especially in today's society with all the people getting dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, Parkinson's disease. It's, like, I, I start to wonder how much of that is from the fact that we didn't know how bad concussions were, you know, like 40, 50 years ago. And they were just telling people, yeah, just play on it. You're fine. And then, right. you know, four years later, they get really bad dementia or Parkinson's or 
Alzheimer's, things like that. And so I think it's just really important to not always rely on your symptoms because oftentimes you forget how well you used to be too until mm-hmm. someone fixes you and there you're just like, whoa, is this what my brain's supposed to do? You mm-hmm. know, is this how I'm mm-hmm. supposed to feel all the time? Because it's that slow progression downwards that people just forget because it becomes their new normal. So. No, exactly. And that is, it's like the, the the frog in the boiling water, right? You don't know how bad it is until it's too late, but yep. uh, the heat is rising. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh dr davis this has been fantastic so far yeah thanks uh, for having me on. appreciate yeah. it i think it's about time for us to step away from our respective computers and go do some eye exercises <laughs> <laughs> um but before we do that can you let our listeners know um how they might be able to reach you find you follow you things like that absolutely so uh you can find me on my website is www.daviskiropracticsd.com so the sd is just for san diego (laughs) and then uh, i'm on instagram at dr kate davis so d-r-k-a-t-e davis d-a-v-i-s um yeah that's how you can reach me so i post a bunch of educational content on instagram um mostly around functional medicine but i'll include some uh some neuro stuff in there as well but Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how you can reach me. And yeah, I appreciate you having me on. This was a really fun conversation. I'm glad I got to catch up a little bit because I know it's been a few years. (laughs) Yeah, this is great. And I cannot wait to come out to San Diego to visit. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) You're like buying your plane to your board. Yeah, it's like, oh, oh, yeah. What were you saying? Yeah. (laughs) Like 80 degrees? Okay. I'm coming. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we're there. Okay. I got some points. (laughs) There we go. Uh, No, this has been great. Hopefully we can have you on again at some point in the future. Um, I think our audience is going to really love uh, this message today. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kate. This has been great. And from your host, take care.